Hey y'all, welcome back to Native Soil. This is episode 24 and our first of our series on converts. And I'm so excited to have this woman right here, Brenda Christian, to be here to tell us about her story of conversion. We have overcome so many things to have this interview. I was looking at our emails this morning and I think I started emailing you in early August. Yes. And then like I got quarantined and I gave you the wrong date one time. (laughs) Hurricane (laughs) happened. But the Lord's brought us here, so I'm, I'm so happy to have you. Um, but before we even get going, the, the, the Lord has put a scripture uh, on Brenda's heart, and we're going to open with that. So I'll, I'm going to hand it over to you, Brenda. Okay, thank you, Father. The word of the Lord came to me. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I dedicated you. A prophet to the nations, I appointed you. Ah, Lord God, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord answered me, Do not say I am too young. To whoever I send you, you shall go. Whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. Then the Lord extended his hands and touched my mouth, saying to me, See, I place my words in your mouth. Today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and to demolish, to build and to plant. And that is coming from Jeremiah chapter 1, um, verses 4 through 10. And thank you. And that kind of, I wanted that because it kind of talks about my journey. You know, I feel like from the very beginning, God was working in my life, but I didn't know it. Right. You know, just like... You know, in Psalm 139, we talk about how we try to run and hide from God, but God knows where we are. We can't hide from him. And right. So, Go to the ends of the earth. He's, yeah. He's still going to be there. He's going to be there. <laughs> and I truly try to run from him. Um, right. So Beautiful. And me working in vocations, I love, I come to that verse so many times. It just speaks so much to that idea of calling. Mm-hmm. And even before I love it, before you're formed in the womb, God's already got your number. Right. He already knows you. He already loves you. He has plans for you. So I'm very excited to hear about this story of how God got your attention over the years. Could you start off? Tell Just tell us about where you're from and some about your family, kind of your background. Okay. I am from Montgomery, Alabama. Amen. I was born. Likewise. That's right. <laughs> Cap City. Cap City. Cap City. I was, um, I'm one of five. I'm the only girl. I have four brothers, and I'm right smack dab in the middle Man, of God them. God bless you. Yes. Um, and so growing up, um, I grew up at in Tulane Court as a house and project, so I grew up in very humble, humble beginnings. Um, but I grew up in a household that was filled with love. Mm. Um, my father passed when I was 12 years old. But one of the things that I... Um, I love to share with people is that my mom was a domestic and um, she worked for St. John the Baptist Catholic um, Church. She was hired by the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, who was you know, uh, St. Catherine Drexel. St. Catherine Drexel. St. Catherine Drexel. Right. But she was hired the year that I was born, hmm. going back to that scripture passage. Um, and, you know, during the 60s, um, blacks either had their babies at home or there's one hospital that they could go to, and that was St. Jude. And you're familiar with St. Yeah, Jude. very historic downtown Montgomery. Yes, and so um, I was born in, at that hospital, and the nuns named me. Again, going back to that scripture passage, I just think God from the very beginning um, was really working on me. Um, well, how did they name you? How did they choose Brenda? That I don't know the story yeah. behind um, Brenda, but I, I do like it. Yeah. I'm, I'm very proud to have that name. You know, whether it's true or not, I feel like it's a derivative of St. Brendan, you know, whose feast day is May 16th. I was born May 12th, born in the, you know, the month of the Blessed Mother. So I just feel like even though I was not born into a Catholic family, that Catholic, you know, influence has always been there. Right. Um, and just like I said, my mom worked for the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. What did she do for them? She was their housekeeper and their cook. Okay. So when I said she was a domestic, that's what she did. Right. Uh, and because we grew up in a housing project, um, and my mom could see the things going on around there, what, you know, when a lot of young girls, 
um, when they reached middle school age, they went up to there's a school. I don't know if you're familiar with Houston Hill. It's right across from Crampton Bowl okay. up in that area. And she saw what happened to most of those young girls, and that was most of them became pregnant, you know, at a very early age. Right. And she said, that's not going to happen to my child. Mm -hmm. I want more for my children. I want them to be better than um, myself. And so she sacrificed, and she enrolled us in Catholic school. So Was that at St. John the Baptist? It was at St. John the Baptist. Okay. That's where... I fell in love with the Catholic Church was at St. John's. Um, the nuns were still there. Um, by the time I finished, it was a mixture of both nuns and, and lay teachers. Right. But it was more the nuns um, that had a big influence on me. Again, remember, I grew up in a house and project. Um, so I was not always treated with kindness by the other students. And the nuns recognized that, and one in particular, Sister Casca. I have a picture of her I want to show you. But she took an, a special interest in me. And so because of that, that was the first time I really felt love outside of the home. Mm. You know, she made me realize, again, that I am wonderfully made, that I am, you know, that I was created in God's image and likeness, and that I have a purpose. Mm. And so um, because of that love, I just, you know, that she showed me, um, I started to fall in love. I wanted to learn more about the, the Catholic Church. Um, so that's my that was my journey. And plus in my home, you know, I think in one of your questions you asked me what was faith like in my home. Right, yeah. My mom was raised Baptist, and right down the street from um, the, the housing project was the Baptist Church, Maggie Street Baptist Church. And Unlike many families today, which I find very sad, say, you know, I'm going to leave it up to my child, you know, to decide what they want to be. So, again, I was I was much older when I was baptized. So I would go to Maggot Street, and it was like a show to me. You know, I really didn't feel um, the spirit moving within me there, you know. Uh, I, I, I couldn't get into the screaming and the hollering. Uh, and I know that's part of the black culture. They like the clapping of the hands, and um, but there was too much of that, and so— Sometimes I sit there and laugh, and I just walk away just empty. Uh, but when I would go to Mass, it was a different feeling. I really felt God talking to me, and I really felt a part of that. Um, so, again, I kept like, well, what am I going to do? You know, that I'm going to Catholic school. Um, this is what I really know. Mm -hmm. um, so, At the school, was it all girls? Or was no, it, it was co-ed. It was, it was, and co it was and was it what was, was it all black or was it black white? It was, was an it all black um, school. Again, remember I was born in the '60s, right. so going to school in the late '60s and early '70s, we still hadn't integrated. Right. You know, even the Catholic Church. Again, but that was the sign of the time. But thank you know, I'm still very thankful for the Josephite priest because that's who was who was there. Right. You know, the Josephite priest and the brothers, um, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. Again, founded by um, Saint Catherine Drexel who, you know, early on, I mean, she comes from a wealthy family who was taught early on that everyone should be educated. And so she had a love for the Native Americans as well as blacks. So she formed that order, Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, that ministered to people um, like myself and others. So um, that's, a, that's a pretty incredible part of history in, in our diocese. <laughs> this saint, you know, visited us <laughs> right. and left behind this, this parish and school. Right. And, uh, you know, you being one of the fruits of that. Um, right. I also like about your story, you got four brothers. Yes. But then the Lord put these sisters in your life, too. Right. You know, uh, yes. to kind of fill in some of the Big those influence, big influence on me. So at what point did um, you said later in life you got baptized? Yes. Was that in the Catholic Church? Yes. Okay. So how did that, when did you get to the point of like, I, these nuns are lovely. They've made me feel wonderfully made, but I think I'm, I think I'm supposed to be a Catholic. I'm supposed to be Catholic. Yeah. Well, like we do now, and back then they didn't call it RCIA. Right. Um, and there was Father Fresnel and he advertised, you know, and they called them convert classes. And you learn that that word just kind of grates with me. It's like, you know, somebody dragging their fingernails across the chalkboard. Um, and so I, you know, um, and I found out I was 15 at the time. And I went to my mom and said, I want to do these classes. I'm ready to take the next step. And she said, go ahead. If that's what you've been called to do, hmm. then do it. How old were you? 
15. Oh, okay, you just said that. Yeah, I was 15. And why is a convert? You said that word. Uh... Uh, well, actually, for me, um, I was truly a convert because I was not baptized. Right. So I was pagan. I was nothing. Yeah, you know, right. so You're a pagan baby. I was a pagan, <laughs> I was a pagan baby. I own up to that. Right. Well, because it puts like a division between us. And the other thing that drives me crazy is to hear people say cradle Catholic. Oh, I'm yeah. a cradle Catholic. Really? So what? Mm. You know? Does that mean you're a better Catholic than I am because I came to it later in life? Right. Or can we all just be Catholic? Can we all just be part of this wonderful church that we've been given? You know, um, and so those two things just. No, I love that. It's funny when uh, Mike O'Neill was one of the people we interviewed mm -hmm. and we were talking about we had a series on Protestants. Right. And he's like, I don't like that term as much because what are we protesting anymore? You know, he's, right. he said, I like to say non-Catholic Christian Mm -hmm. Just since like we're all part of the body of Christ. So yes. kind of that emphasis on we are all family. It's a big, messy family. Mm -hmm. But let's focus on the fact we already are family and we're called to deepen that and live that. And it, right. it sounds like a similar perspective right. that you have as well. You know, yeah, because, you know, we have the daughters of Mary and some people, you know, when they're getting ready to share. And I don't say anything then, but I just kind of tap my fingers a little bit and they go, you know, well, I'm a cradle Catholic. And they, you know, are we separate? You know, are we segregated? Does it? Are you a much better Catholic because you know your mom brought you to the church when you were baptized? But again, I don't think that's what they mean. But again, I don't like the separation. We're yeah. all Catholic. We keep saying we're this one. Yeah, it means universal. It means we're all connected. We're all connected. And the same thing. You know, one of my good friends, and she's on the RCA with me, and she was sharing her story. She said, "Well, I'm a convert. You know, I'm a convert. I converted 45 years ago. And finally, she said it one time to many. And I looked at her and said, well, when are you going to become Catholic? You know, you're Catholic. Yeah, <laughs> so right. That's just my thing. Let's accept who we are. Let's share our faith. You know, we'll share our journey. And it's, you know, so. I like that. Now, um, so you become Catholic around the age of 15. Mm -hmm. And how did... Um, like your brothers, your extended family, how did everyone react to that? Was 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 there any pushback or no? Because actually, I found out yesterday because I was at home, I went home, I went to visit my mom yesterday, and uh, my oldest brother was there, and we were talking about it. And actually, he was baptized younger because he was an altar server. Hmm. I mean, he uh, he and my I have like I said, I'm in the middle. My two older brothers, they both were altar servers. So I don't know what was different about me that you know. Maybe it's like when they told her, oh, you got a girl. She went, oh, she could have been a boy, too, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> that was her attitude. Maybe that's why the nuns named me. I don't know. <laughs> right. So are any other members of your family Catholic now, or is um, it you and your brother? Um, I, well, they were all four uh, were baptized. And my mom, the year I got married, or the year after I got married, became Catholic. No kidding. At St. John the Baptist, yes. So it's kind of been this slow work in your family. The Lord kind right. of put these people in your life and uh, with the nuns and the priests. Mm -hmm. And it's it's cool to see that seed planted and over the years kind of take, take root. Take root, take root, yeah. And the thing is, you know, you were talking about my household. One of the things that was, uh, in my household was that if you didn't get up and go to church or go to mass, you couldn't do anything on Sunday. You know, if you were too tired or too sick, you couldn't watch television. You couldn't sit on the porch. You couldn't do nothing because, you know, if you can't make time for God, you don't have time for anything. And that was my mom's rule. That's good. Um, Everyone listening, that's a great rule. If you don't go to mass, <laughs> everything else gets canceled for the day. <laughs> and she was, I mean, nothing. Um, yeah. So she really respected God's day. And even though she was not Catholic, and I don't know if it's because she worked for the nuns, there were a lot of Catholic icons in our home you know mm. there was always i can remember a crucifix always hanging over the doorway there was a picture of mary there i mean mary was whether it was a picture or a statue i mean she has a statue now in her home that i told her i've been trying to get but she said you're gonna have to wait till i'm dead and gone before you can right. have it so but that catholic influence is even in the house and i didn't realize that mm -hmm. so it's an amazing story and what would you say I know just talking uh, on the phone, we on a previous episode, you know, we looked at some of kind of the black Catholic experience mm -hmm. and had talked about like Sister Thea Bowman. And yes, I remember you saying like you feel like kindred spirit because the same kind of thing, like she was non-Catholic right. in Mississippi, raised by nuns. Mm -hmm. And that's how she came to faith. What was it like going from Montgomery being black and Catholic and then moving to Mobile into that space? Um 
what what's that experience been like for you? Like you said, when are we going to be Catholic? Like we're all kind of part of this together. Right. But you had a particular experience there at St. John's. Now you've worked at St. Dominic's for... 26 years. 26 years. Yes. Which is 26. incredible. Uh, yes. We need to get into that. But what was that a transition like? Like going from a black Catholic community into kind of like a more integrated community? For me, it wasn't hard. Um, well, the hardest part when, when we moved from Montgomery to Mobile was finding a church that welcomed me. Um, I visited two previous, two, you know, um, Catholic parishes and it's like, hmm, no. And then someone, uh, because I worked outside the home when I, when my children were little, um, the lady that was keeping me said, try St. Dominic, see what you think about that. And I promise you from the moment I walked through the doors at St. Dominic, I felt at home. Hmm. You know, St. Dominic is a predominantly white Catholic church. Um, you know, Wiley and I, we're probably, so one of seven at the most black families in the church, but I don't think anybody look at me um, as being black. Mm. I think what they see is a woman of faith, someone who loves the church, someone who loves being around the children, someone who loves sharing the faith um, whenever given the opportunity. So, you know, while I was, we were talking about this last night, he says, do you remember when the guy asked us, how come we didn't go to St. James? And I said, but why would we? And the answer was, well, you're black. That's what you, and that is so, to me, an archaic way of thinking. We should go to Mass where we feel most comfortable. Again, I'm not into, um, I love the structure of our Mass. I love the way the church has, has arranged it. Um, for me, that quietness that we, we have, um, I like that. There's a time and place for the clapping and the gospel part of it. And, um, you know, we can do that during Black History Month. I mean, there's times when the, um, we've had the Black History Mass for the black community. But I love the fact that we have a mass where we all can come together and worship together. Mm -hmm. We gotta quit looking at it as the white Catholic church, the black Catholic church or Hispanic. Again, going back to we're one, that one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Um, and I don't feel like I've lost my blackness because I worship at St. Dominic. I feel I'm at home there, so. And in the midst of that, how did you get into working over there? Uh, 20, you said six years? 26 years. Yeah. Well, children, again, running from God. Um, my undergraduate degree is in finance, okay? Growing up in very humble beginnings, my uh, oldest brother convinced me, because I wanted to be a teacher, and my oldest brother con convinced me. He goes, you don't want to be a teacher. They don't make any money. You know, you need to go into business, some, something like that. Okay, had a lot of love and respect for him. So my undergraduate degree is in finance, so I worked outside the home. Well, my daughter was in school at St. Dominic, and just about every other day I was getting a phone call. I don't feel good. Can you come pick me up? And I'm thinking, I'm going to lose my job. Ain't nobody's going to let me leave every day to come pick her up. And really she wasn't ill. She was separ you know, had anxiety separation, so... Again, went to Wiley. Look, we've got to do something. Let's look at our finances. Let's look and see what we can cut out. And lo and behold, there was a position that came open at St. Dominic that following year on the school side. So I went, I interviewed uh, for the position, and I got it. And I have been there ever since. You know, I started out on the school side. Um, the first year I worked there, I worked in a lunchroom. Because for me, it meant more to me to be with my children uh, when they needed me. You know, when your child looks at you and say, how come I have to go to school during the summer when my friend's parents are home with them? You know. Right. Heartstrings, pulling at my heartstrings. So right. We made it work. Um, and then the next year, a position came open in the second grade classroom. And that was very renewing for me because what happens in second grade? The sacraments happened to prepare the kids for reconciliation and First Communion. And that just renewed my love again for the church and what it, what it stands for. And um, in 2004, Father Skanecki sent for me one day. Um, said, he sent somebody over and said, tell Brenda I need for her to come see me when she gets off at 2 o'clock. I'm thinking, I just got here, so I couldn't have done or said anything. You know, what could he want with me? And that's when he offered me to take on the position um, of the children's religious ed program. Right. 
the CCD because Miss Houston was retiring. And so he said, would you be willing to do that? And I'm thinking, yes. And so that's where all the faith formation really kicked in. And then Father Saint came and he wanted a full-time DRE. And I go, here I am, pick me, pick me, <laughs> you know. And, um, and I love telling this story because he was in charge again because I was not his first choice. I was not his second choice. I was the third choice. Um, you know, he interviewed and he actually allowed me to interview um, because I'd been, you know, just out of loyalty to me because he knew I loved the parish. And the first two people he offered the position for, um, you know, they declined for whatever reason. And so he called me over after school to come talk to him. He says, well, since we can't hire for love, I mean, since we can't hire for experience, we're going to hire for love. So I got the position um, because I love the parish and the parish, you know, had a lot of love and respect for me, which yeah. is a good thing. But there were some stipulations. I had to go and get my master's. And he said, are you okay with that? Fine. He says, and then the first year I want you to work with a mentor. Are you okay with that? Fine. All I want to do is serve the parish. And so that's how that came to be. Wow. I spent 12 years on the school side. And then, um, so now I'm here. Uh, 14 years on the piers. And where did you do the masters? How did, at Spring Hill. At Spring Hill, so right down when the I, road. Right down the road, right down to Spring Hill. As you're, as you're saying all this, I'm just thinking about your mom mm -hmm. and her working for the church and that connection, you know, like in God's plan, mm -hmm. connected not just you but your whole family to right. uh, the Catholic faith, to those sisters. And also it's kind of like this template like for you later in life mm -hmm. of – she had a love for the church, like you said, even before y'all were uh, Catholic. Mm -hmm. There was that love, even with the imagery in your house. There was just that love, like you're talking about, was like right. her qualification. And it's neat to see that how that translates to the next generation with you. Right. So that you just have this heart to be in the parish. Um, so I think that's a cool connection. And I think that's really how we, I met you the first time was through your work with right. uh, Faith Formation. Mm -hmm. I think. I was thinking about this this morning. I think we did that joint retreat, retreat together with eighth grades. Uh, mm -hmm. I was at Christ the King, and we kind of brought our eighth grades together and um, were able to collaborate on that. Right. So it's just neat to see the Lord bringing us together in these different ways. And two, the thing your story impresses me is, um, you know, your beginnings is in Montgomery, Alabama like birthplace of civil rights. You're going to this mm -hmm. small segregated Catholic school. Um, you become Catholic and you're here in Mobile. And I think um, in the black Catholic community, you know, we, we, we still do have, tr you know, the traditionally black parishes, right. Uh, which are important and, and they come from a, a certain history and all. And so like trying to bring renewal there, but at the same time, uh, there's people like you where the Lord has kind of moved into uh, a different setting where there's whites, there's Hispanics. And I just think it's neat to see the, it's the slow work of God. It we're, is. We're slow to respond. You know? <laughs> but the fact that um, I see you kind of as like this bridge builder, you know, and like you said, um, only one of seven families, you know, like when you first got to St. Dominic's. But it takes some risk to, for us to kind of place ourselves in new environments. It does. But for people to learn to, to, to see each other, love each other, and, okay, we have our differences, but to be able to see beyond it at some point and see that thing that we have in common, I love mm -hmm. how you kept going to back to that of what unites us is our faith in Christ, you know, this Catholic faith, this mass that's the same in every Catholic church all mm -hmm. over the world, like for 1.2 billion people. I just think it's a... There's a lot of things going on in your story, but I yeah. think it's it's neat to see uh, how the Lord has worked through it. Right. When is, Wiley and I were talking um, last night, I was just kind of looking over and trying to think, you know, how am I going to approach this? And one of the things you asked me was, how can we intentionally bring the communities together to kind of to, to borrow from our um, this event that we just did, shrink the divide within our own community? Yes. And one of the things Wiley said, Brenda, he says, you know, we need to encourage each other to visit each other's parishes, you know, um, so we can learn more about one another. You know, um, the Knights of Peter Cla Claver need to do things with the Knights of Columbus. You know, a lot of, you know, that started 
because there was nothing, you know, black. Again, they couldn't be Knights of Columbus. They could not be <laughs> Knights of Columbus. But now that we can, you right. know, do we really still need to have two organizations? Or, I mean, if we do, that's fine. But how can we intermingle? How can we come together and share our gifts with one another? Um, again, I want us to look like one. Right. Um, but, you know, he was saying, you know, people from St. Ignatius to feel comfortable going down to Most Pure Heart of Mary or St. Joseph in Maysville and vice versa. The people from St. Francis Xavier, you know, should feel comfortable coming in St. Dominic or our, uh, our Savior or Ignatius. You know, we should not feel uncomfortable in our own parish. Right. Again, you know, we're one just like we can go out of the country and go to mass somewhere. How come we can't come across town and celebrate mass together? and feel welcome. Uh, And to me, being Catholic, it's, uh, I forget there's a a British writer, but he said, when it comes to the Catholics, here comes everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's everybody's in there. It's like a big tent. We might be over here and over here and over here, but everybody's a part of it. And I think, um, but the unity, you know, we talk about communion. Mm -hmm. We go to Mass, we receive communion communion to bring us into communion with Christ but to also bring us into communion with one another. Right. But the communion is all the more impressive. It's all the more miraculous because of that diversity. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the miracle of Christ. Like that's, that's the working of grace is to be able to regather like all the children of God into this one Mm -hmm. fold. And Mm -hmm. and for us to, you know, we say we're all brothers and sisters, but to live that reality of being brothers and sisters. And what does it look like? You know, I think it takes a lot of prayer and a lot of imagination. For, it does. For what, what does it mean to shrink that divide mm-hmm. between us um, denominationally, racially? But um, what an important work of the Spirit for us to be open to. Mm-hmm. I think we need to, um, you know, I've had people to leave St. Dominic and go to Most Pure Heart of Mary, which is fine. If that's what feeds you spiritually, then do that. Um, but it breaks my heart when I hear people say, I'm not getting anything out of Mass. Mm-hmm. And you know, and I think uh, Sister Bowman even said it in her talk to the uh, bishops. She says, but what are you bringing? You know, we have to bring something. And I can't say every time I go to Mass, the homily speaks to me. But again, was I open to hear you know, what the priest was saying at that moment? Or was it, you know, for me? Sometimes his homily is not for me. It's not what God wants me to hear. But I do get something every time. I'm nourished, you know, by his word, and I'm nourished by his body. Like you were saying, we go to communion. So I do walk away with something, Mm -hmm. you know. So, but, you know, we're all into um, being entertained. And coming to Mass is not being entertained. It's about, you know, giving ourselves over completely to God and surrendering to his will. Um, so that we can take what we just heard and what we received back out into the world. Um, and, I, and I think that's what I really love about being Catholic, that I get something that I can take back out. Whether people listen to me or not, different story. <laughs> but at least I'm willing, you know, to right. take it out. And I think that's just the, the whole idea of even this, this whole idea of native soil mm-hmm. is the sense of the soil is not going to till itself. Right. It's not going to plant itself. It's not going to water itself, you know, but for us to have this, this great harvest of uh, the gospel, you know, it takes all of us doing our part, mm-hmm. like in each of our parishes. It's interesting. There's just a new uh, directive that came out from the Vatican talking about kind of evangelism in this day and age. And one of the things they're saying is there's a need for people to be rooted and participatory in your parish, right. you know, because a lot of people are just so transient, you know, today people don't want to be kind of committed to anything. So there's some need to kind of like be rooted into your parish community and to those parish, ba- the needs of your parish boundary. Right. But at the same time, they talk about kind of what you're saying is we also need to be collaborative with mm-hmm. the other parishes in our area because um, we're, we're not all just living in our little bubbles anymore. Right. And so we have to kind of open our eyes to, you got to be at one, rooted where you are in your parish community, be a part of it, but also open to how can the gifts and talents of this parish come alongside those of, of the parishes near us? Right. You know, and like I like you said, of you know, from time to time visiting parishes and seeing what that's like and being mm-hmm. open to that cultural expression of the faith. You know, it's the same mass, but there's these different feels and flavors, mm-hmm. which are all part of the church. So, um, you know, uh, there's a couple of dudes in the Vatican that have some similar ideas as you. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
hope in my lifetime we can <laughs> really bring it together. Yeah. You know? Awesome. I mean, that'll be a great revival, right? That's it. I think so. I think it is. The more we come together, the more the, the spirit will work. Yeah. But, um, well, this has been so beautiful. Do you have any kind of closing thoughts? Any Anything else? Uh, you got your notes here. Uh, yeah. Did we cover it all? <laughs> I, I think we did. You know, um, I was... You know, when I looked at one of the questions and I had to go back and, and rethink it, the first time when I read it, it goes, the question again, what is it like being black and Catholic? And I thought, hmm. And I've never really given that any thought because, again, like I said, I just think of myself as being Catholic. And so I first went to, I don't know, if, have you ever seen the original movie um, with Sidney Poitier and Spencer Tracy? Guess who's coming to dinner? I have not. Okay. You need to watch that movie. It's a comedy and it's a drama drama, but it um, came out at a great time. But anyway, Sidney Poitier um, is engaged to a white girl in this movie, and she brings him home. And so her parents are this very liberal and accepting couple until they're faced with their daughter coming home. Dating a black guy. <laughs> Dating this black guy, and she's saying, I'm going to marry him. Right. Well, his parents feel the same way. So he's ha off having this conversation with his dad and his dad is talking about, you know, I did this for you. I, you know, walked so many miles with you, blah, blah. And so Sidney Poitier's character says, you did that because that was what you were supposed to do. I was your son. That's what parents do. And he did it in a very harsh tone. Mm -hmm. And then he calmed down and he turned to him. He says, dad, I love you. He says, but the issue with you is you look at yourself as a colored man, whereas I look at myself as just a man. And I share that because I don't look at myself as a black Catholic. I look at myself as a Catholic who's been called by God to do, you know, to bring others to him. Um, but then I thought about Sister Bow, uh, Bowman and, and her take on that. Right. And, um, and she said it beautifully too, was that I bring myself, you know, fully functioning. Yes. You know, I bring all that I am um, and all that I hope to be to the church. So I, I, I take both of them with me. You know, I, I like her take. Right. And I like the fact that when people see me, um, they don't go, oh, there's that black woman who works for the church. Yeah. Or, but there's that lady who loves God and is not afraid to talk about her faith. Right. Yeah, there's that tension because on, on one hand, we're Catholic. That's like mm -hmm. our identity. But there is this this thing is God did make us different. Right. right? You know, so yeah. you are black and I'm white. But to be able to celebrate that. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think it is a beautiful thing, too. Like you said, obviously, that's part of the experience. St. Dominic's like you said, OK, I can kind of my eyes are open. My kids eyes are open. The fact mm -hmm. okay, we're like one of the seven, you know, black families. We look different. Mm -hmm. But um, all the more it's that communion within diversity is happening. Right. And so it is a real tension because on one hand it's like, yeah, we're all brothers and sisters. We're all Catholic. But on the other hand is like, yeah, we are different. We, we do look different. We do have different, uh, right. when we bring our whole self to mass, it, it can look a little different, but praise God. Praise God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Hey, I'm wonderfully made, you know, he made me this, yeah. you know, I had a little girl ask me, and, you know, and most people know I love children and she kept crawling on me and she looked at me and she says, can I ask you something? I said, sure. She says, how come your skin is brown and mine's not? And I said, because God baked me a little longer than he did you. So, And she was <laughs> she was satisfied with that. So. <laughs> that solved her riddle. <laughs> that solved her riddle. <laughs> She's like, oh, yeah. Okay. Like, I've seen cookies in the oven before. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so, so she was satisfied with it. Awesome. But again. Well, we have covered a lot of ground. Okay. And I think it's a blessed ground. Thank you. And um, one last thing for us to do. You want that soil. I want that soil. <laughs> did you bring it? I brought it. Okay. I brought it. And where did you choose to bring your soil from? Yeah. I soil. You got it hidden? You got one of those big mom purses with 18 compartments. Oh, there it is. This is my soil. Okay. And, you know, I forgot to add my St. Dominic soil in there because St. Dominic is so much a part of who I am. Right. St. Dominic has allowed me to continue to grow and to fall in love with the church. But this is from St. John the Baptist. I think that's a fitting choice. <laughs> your story. I think <laughs> that's a pretty fitting John choice. The Baptist. Did you get it when you saw your mom? No, yesterday? I did not. You did it earlier? I had a little angel that wears black clerics. Oh, that's get. right. I remember Father Driscoll saying he made yes. a, a, made a uh -huh. little stop for you. Yes. 
Uh, so this is this is very special. This is very special soil. I'm trying not to mess up your table. It's all right. We can we can clean it. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's a good healthy portion there. Yes. All right. So I want I want to do I want you to I want you to put that uh, top the there. I want you to sign it so we remember whose whose soil it is. I mean, a saint walked on that soil. That's right. So uh, I don't know that we've we've had that that level of soil yet on the show. So that's pretty special. And um, where your mom worked, where you went to school, where you uh, found out you were wonderfully and beautifully made, you became a Catholic. Became a Catholic. And started this whole journey uh, with all of us. So um, if you would hold the soil, I'm going to close. I just want to pray over you, over your soil, okay. which represents this beautiful journey you've given witness to. And uh, we'll just close in prayer. Okay. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for Brenda. Thank you um, for having her number even before she was born. Uh, being born there in Montgomery, her mom having that job with the sisters uh, there at St. John the Baptist, for, for the sisters giving her her name, for uh, the love that she felt from those sisters and that call, that invitation to, to become Catholic. Thank you for her whole journey, Lord. And we just ask your continued blessing upon her, her family, her ministry. Um, we ask blessing upon the soil she holds in her hands, all that represents Brenda's life in St. John the Baptist Parish. And uh, we just we just place Brenda and, and her family and her story in your hands in a special way through the intercession of the Blessed Mother. And so we pray. Hail, Hail Mary, Mary, full, full of, of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed, blessed art thou amongst, among women, women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for, for us sinners, sinners now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. Through her intercession, through the intercession of St. Catherine and Drexel, may Almighty God bless you, your soil, and all of those listening, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. See you right here next time on Native Soil.